Hello, I don't know whether um, you can see me, but you may be able to hear me. My name is Ian Firth. Um, I'm your chair for today. Um, I am past president of the institution and uh, you are all very, very welcome indeed to what I hope will be a really first class evening. Um, just before we start, um, I just have a couple of reminders for you all. Um, there is a, a facility to ask questions uh, on the right of your screen. There's a, uh, a possibility to uh, put a question in there. I'm sure you've worked out how to do that before. Uh, please do put those in. Don't wait until the end. Pop them in during the talk if it, as it occurs to you who want to. We'll be keeping an eye on those and hopefully we will have time to ask um, some, if not all, of those questions uh, to the speaker at the end. Um, and if there are any issues or any technical problems um, with your audio or video or whatever else, please check your connection. There is a link directly underneath the slides and you can also chat live with technical support. There's another one of those links in the facility there. So please do um, sort that out. Don't, 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 don't suffer in silence if you're having technical difficulties, as I sometimes do. But uh, as I say, big welcome to you all to the Institution of Structural Engineers um, virtually this evening. And it's a real pleasure to introduce Simon. Simon uh, is somebody I've known for, for uh, a good long time, actually. Um, uh, so I don't know, Simon, when I first met you, but um, uh, Simon is a, a, an engineer with over 30 years of experience, and I think I've probably known you for a good many of those, um, uh, working in bridges um, and civil engineering projects, having joined Gura Happel from Mornsel in 2001. Um, Simon's work ranges in scale from, from you know, overhead gantries uh, and also large major cable save bridges such as the Northern Spire in Sunderland. Many of you will know that design, I'm sure. Uh, he has a particular fascination with creatively designed structures, and I can certainly um, relate to his thinking there. And many of his projects involve challenging site constraints or demanding engineering uh, from first principles. So, Simon, um, you are really welcome. We're delighted that you're able to speak to us tonight, um, and I hope that all goes well with the technology. So I'm going to uh, be quiet and hand over to Simon, Simon Fry from Bureau Happold, Looking forward to hearing what you have to say to us about the Little Langevoort in Copenhagen. Um, Thanks very much, Ian, and good evening, everybody. Um, just to check before I go any further, you can hear me okay? Is that okay, Ian? Yes, I can hear you. Good, good, good stuff. Okay, so uh, my presentation's on the Little Langebro in Copenhagen. Um, a fantastic project to have worked on. I just hope I can get some of the sort of interesting points across to you. Um, this is the structure of my talk. I'm going to take you through all the way from uh, the initial design, the competition entry that we uh, made way back in 2015, all the way through to um, construction of the bridge and commissioning and, and uh, bringing it into use. Um, with particular attention paid to one or two of the unique features of the bridge, uh, including uh, a, a new kind of uh, connection detail, which we've, uh, we've, we've incorporated. So how it all began, this is the uh, bridge site in the centre of Copenhagen. Uh, the, the inner harbour is before us. Uh, and actually there's an arrow which is pointing to the site. Actually, you might notice it's very close to another bridge. Uh, that's called the Langebro or Long Bridge. And uh, the, our bridge, the Little Langebro, is the Little Long Bridge. Um, so uh, a nice, nice name there. So the Langebro is not a particularly good bridge for uh, pedestrians and cyclists to use. It's extremely busy. It's the main arterial route from north to south in Copenhagen. It's got very narrow footways and cyclists sharing the road with uh, heavy vehicles and, and uh, lots of traffic is not ideal at all. So our bridge is to uh, provide a, an additional link uh, across the harbour uh, from one side to the other, uh, from A to B, um, uh, and for pedestrians and for cyclists. It's, uh, it was uh, commissioned by Real Dania, who uh, also had a, uh, a development which they were building called the Blocks Project. 
on the uh, north side of, of the harbour, as shown. Uh, and after the bridge was built, it was gifted to the people of Copenhagen. So this was the brief that was issued by Real Dania. As I say, this was actually, the, the initial invitation came out in 2014. Uh, and this was what we were aiming to achieve, a new pedestrian cycle bridge. Uh, the budget was 90 million kroner, which is only about 9 million pounds. So actually that's not a particularly generous budget. The overall length of the bridge, 160 meters. Now it's very busy uh, harbour. The Langebro is an opening bridge, it's a bascule bridge, and we had to similarly provide a facility for large vessels to get through the uh, through our bridge. A uh, 35 meter wide navigation channel was required, which is actually quite a wide navigation channel. Um, and the bridge itself had to accommodate pedestrians and cyclists, four meters for two uh, bi-directional cycleway segregated from a three meter footway so this is the design that we came up with so our team consisted at the competition stage of Bureau Happold working with Wilkinson Air Architects and Eden Consulting who are specialist mechanical engineers uh, so here's the sort of evolution of, of the bridge concept just starting from A to B with a straight line uh, and then thinking about aligning the bridge to the axes on either side. So on one side is Vesta Volgaard and the other side was Langebrogaard and we wanted to try to align with those axes. So that naturally introduced a bit of curvature into the bridge, which is always good for making the bridge a bit more interesting, particularly as you walk along the bridge. Um, the next step was to raise the bridge because it had to provide a certain amount of clearance even when it was in its closed position. So that demanded a, a, a bit of vertical um, uh, gradient on the bridge. Uh, but that also afforded views of the harbour and of the city. Um, so that was a, a, a nice feature as well. So having came up with our alignment, you can now see it superimposed on the plan next to the Langebro uh, with the navigation channel marked there. In terms of the architecture for the bridge, the inspiration was uh, a bird flapping its wings um, up and down and you can see the way that the structure moves up and down. Um, not just in a, 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 an aesthetically pleasing manner but in a manner which reflected the structural demand on the bridge uh, along its length so wherever the uh, section needed to be greatest that's when uh, uh, those edge members were had the greatest depth and in doing so we also introduced an interesting twist to those edge members uh, which resulted in doubly curved plates uh, forming this sort of ribbon uh, structure um, across the bridge. And here are some competition images. Um, that's the bridge in its closed position. You can see the Langebro on the left hand side here. Uh, this Langebro is, as I mentioned, it's a bascule bridge. It has its own control tower and that was convenient because we could also control the new bridge from that position as well. And here's the bridge in its open condition. So it's a, actually a swing bridge. It has two portions of bridge which uh, rotate on slewing rings to allow uh, the ships to pass through. Okay, so now I'm going to make no apologies for talking a bit about the structural engineering behind the bridge, uh, given the audience. This hopefully contains quite a number of structural engineers. So once again, here is uh, the plan view of the bridge and you notice that there are some quite large vessel collision protection uh, barriers provided that they have to be that size in order to protect the, um, the bridge when it's parked in the open position. 
and this elevation shows the support arrangement. There are four piers in the uh, in the harbour. Uh, they are founded on the limestone uh, down below the, the harbour bed. Uh, they're just uh, we, we constructed them with sheet piles to form a, a cell, which was then filled uh, with a um, with a layer of fill, compacted fill material and then uh, concrete, and then uh, we built our piers on top of those and then there are piled foundations uh, at the ends of the bridge. Here you can see the way that the structure is articulated so it's actually split into four more or less equal uh, bridge sections. Section two and section three are the two pieces which rotate on slewing rings which are positioned within those uh, bridge piers. Uh, section one and four are fixed to the abutments and there are movement joints which allow for expansion and contraction of the bridge. At the centre of the bridge is the moment connection which rather than uh, acting as a pin which would be more normal with a swing bridge clamps the two sections of bridge together to uh, provide moment continuity. Uh, the importance of that is that it makes the bridge act as though it was continuous and enables us to have a much more slender structure, uh, a more efficient structure. Um, and particularly important because we didn't want to have high sides on the structure which would disrupt the views of the harbour, but it also makes good structural sense. This is the, the form of the bridge piers. So we have inclined uh, props below the, the edges of the bridge and this one is the moving moving pier which has got a slewing ring as I mentioned with motors to turn the sections of, of, of steelwork. Now to the, the deck itself. The main members which run longitudinally along the edges of the bridge are triangular in cross section uh, because of the double curvature, we kept the plate thickness uh, 15 millimeters maximum, um, and there is stiffening provided inside those uh, box sections uh, to, to, to form the shape and also to supplement the strength in some areas where it's required. And then there's a series of cross members and a, a, a deck plate. Uh, with stiffeners, orthotropic uh, deck plate. You can see that um, the, the three metre wide footway and the four metre wide cycleway marked on here. So that was the section at one end of the bridge. As we move away from the end, the sides of the bridge um, undulate up and down as I mentioned, where we have the greatest uh, structural demand, we have the greatest depth. So in the very centre of the bridge, the tips of the, of the triangles are pointed upwards, as shown here. And you notice that the parapets also follow quite an interesting uh, alignment. So the handrail is kept uh, more or less constant position relative to the deck, but the supporting um, parapets, posts and, and mesh move up and down, which exaggerates this flowing nature of the bridge. Um, a number of very interesting details involved in the steelwork of the bridge. So uh, the tip of the triangular box sections is particularly important. That is something that one reads as you look along the bridge. Uh, and that had to be just so, so we spent a lot of time working on the detailing of that and doing some trials as well to make sure that we could produce that detail nicely. Uh, there's also a detail at deck level, which um, is uh, unusual, I suppose, at this, this position here. We had to ensure that the steelwork wouldn't be damaged when snow is cleared from the bridge. So you, the machine that they use we had to introduce a, uh, a bit of a rubbing strip there, a stainless steel rubbing strip, just to prevent any damage occurring to the main structure at that location. 
some more uh, details of the of the of the structure. So the the transverse members are shown here. There are these sort of folded plates, which span across from one side of to of the bridge deck to the other. Um, and this is that corner detail, um, which I I mentioned just now, uh, which was very important. And there's stiffening diaphragms inside the triangular sections. The typical diaphragms were only welded on uh, two of the three sides uh, to make them more e easier to fabricate. So with such an unusually shaped bridge, uh, which is an opening structure, um, we were particularly interested to um, check the effect of temperature and heat on the bridge um, because this is one of the Achilles heels of, of, of moving bridges. The, the movements that occur under thermal effects can be quite unpredictable. And with such a, a, a uniquely shaped structure, um, we felt that we had to go into quite a lot of detail on this aspect. Um, so we used the, the bridge model and we looked at the position of the sun throughout the year and at different times of the day and different patterns of heating of, 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 the, of the bridge plates. So not just looking at a very simple uh, temperature gradients through the bridge, but looking at all kinds of different patterns of heating that could occur and give rise to vertical and lateral displacements of the bridge. At, particularly at the joints where we needed to have an idea of the, of the movements that would occur so that we could detail those connections appropriately. So once we'd done this exercise, we could take an envelope of all the possible conditions. And in, as I say, we could dimension the, the, the gaps uh, and, and the joints to ensure that uh, we wouldn't have an issue with the bridge jamming. Um, the bridge being a cantilever kind of structure, we, we had to apply pre-camber. You can see that th this is one of the moving sections um, which had uh, mechanical equipment housed at the tip of the cantilever, so that quite a significant pre-camber was applied. The fabrication geometry was uh, developed based on having applied this pre-camber to all of the bridge steelwork. And actually, the predictions were um, pretty good. And there's just another view of the fabrication model of the bridge, which might give an, a bit more of an idea of how the, the structure is built up with its cross members and the orthotropic deck plate and the inclined V supports and so forth. Um, one of the things that uh, we did was that we introduced, uh, at the point at which the bridge out, went out to tender, we introduced a requirement for the tendering contractors to build a, a, a full-scale mock-up of part of the bridge. Um, again, to try to guarantee the quality of, of, the, of the steelwork. So these are relatively short sections of bridge, but they are long enough to have a bit of twist in the uh, plates, a bit of curvature, and incorporate most of the critical details that we were interested in. So the, these are the mock-ups produced by the final two competing uh, contracting teams. Uh, actually, both were of a, a very high standard, and it was it was other factors that uh, came into play when uh, making the final selection. But I think this was a very useful exercise. Also enabled us to check that some of the details that we'd come up with were feasible and uh, didn't give rise to unreasonable uh, fabrication difficulties. So this is the team that we eventually um, had uh, at the end of the tender process. And we were novated across to work for the contractor for the remainder of the project uh, to complete the detailed design and the construction of the bridge. So Riordania were the, um, the, the main client, as I mentioned 
the bridge was being gifted to the Copenhagen municipality and therefore they were a key stakeholder in the, in the, in the project. They were particularly interested in the way that the bridge would be operated and maintained because that would be their, their task. Um, the contractors were a joint venture of Mobilis and Hollandia. And uh, the design team, you can see there, was the original uh, members, Bureau Happold, Eden Consulting and Wilkinson Air, supplemented by um, NIRAS, an urban agency who are local engineers and, and architects respect, respectively. So NIRAS helped us with the, um, particularly with the geotechnical uh, design having a bit of knowledge of the ground conditions in, in Copenhagen. Spears and Major were also involved in the lighting design for the bridge. So I'm now going to talk about the moment connection, which is, uh, I think, I think is a first for, for moving bridges. Um, be interested to see if we can apply it on any other structures, but, um, Normally, at the junction between uh, swinging bridge, swing bridge parts and even bascule bridges, you will have a locking pin, which uh, maintains the alignment of the of the bridge at that location, uh, but just acts as a pin rather than a, a, a moment connection. So our idea was to actually clamp the bridge at that location. Um, that was partly due to the slenderness issue and trying to keep the structure um, as slender as possible by making it act as though it were continuous. Also because there was some reluctance by the client and by the municipality to having uh, the, the typical uh, nose pin type detail, which had given them issues in, on other bridges that they're responsible for. So this is a, a view of the assembly. Um, so just going back here, you can see we've got these moment connection um, assemblies on either side of the bridge, and there's a joint in between with deck flaps. So there, there, there's an upper and a lower um, ram. This is the upper ram which is a, a compression ram so uh, being in the sagging region you get compression in the top and then we have a, a tension element in the bottom so these are these are hydraulic uh, rams with uh, with these uh, pistons and, and then some bespoke pieces on the end and this is the on the other face of the joint we have at the top a compression socket and at the bottom uh, a tension socket which accept those two pieces so you can see what happens when the as this is a, a view of the whole assembly so this is the compression pin and the socket and this is the tension we call this the hammer head and there's the tension socket on the bottom so as the bridge um, came, pieces came together, oops, like so, these things were designed so that the bridge could be slid into place like so. And then what would happen is that the compression pin would be the first element to be energized. And then the tension element on the bottom would be energized to form that clamp and then the preload up to a certain pressure would be applied to those cylinders to just to overcome any reversal of load which could have occur at that um, location in service so we have compression on the top and tension on the bottom so that enables us to clamp the sections together and carry moment at that location but one of the features of this uh, connection is that if there is axial expansion or contraction then the oil from one cylinder uh, can flow into the other cylinder 
and just allow that movement to occur without increasing the forces in the cylinder. So they're, they're linked together hydraulically to enable that to happen. So you can see that the oil just flows from the one cylinder to the other as gradual expansion and contraction occurs. Another byproduct of this connection is its advantages in terms of dynamic performance of the bridge. So quite apart from a moment connection being better from the point of view of stiffness and deflection and dynamics on the bridge, um, actually the fact that it, it's actually, actually re released for long-term movements and fer thermal movements and thermal effects, but actually any shock loading or dynamic effects, it behaves as though it's actually fixed and that gives uh, considerable benefits in terms of the dynamic performance of the bridge. It acts a rather like a damper um, and uh, enabled us again to, to, to make the structure more economical as a result. This is the bridge in the workshop. Um, the bridge parts were all laid out on a jig, uh, which was pretty impressive fabrication in its own right in order to define the geometry of this uh, sweeping complex uh, curving structure. And here's some of the bridge components ready to be assembled. So they they were all bent uh, and uh, delivered to the, the workshop for assembly, rather like a kit. Um, see various components here. There's some, these are the cross members which span across the underside of the bridge. And you can see the, the curvature of these plates as they're not lying flat on the floor of the factory. Here you can see the way that the bridge, uh, bridge plates are doubly curved. So this work was undertaken by a specialist company, CIG. And um, it's remarkable how accurately the plates can be bent. Um, some remarkable tolerances, some very skillful, the way that these uh, large plates can be, can be bent to great accuracy. The bridge sections were constructed upside down because the majority of the welding was underneath. Uh, here you can see the V column. Uh, again, that, that, that's quite a slender structure in its own right. And then once the sections were completed, they were flipped over and turned up the right way outside. And here's a completed bridge section uh, ready to be loaded onto the ship for delivery um, from Rotterdam where the bridge was fabricated to Copenhagen. So a full uh, trial assembly was undertaken at the workshop, all the sections laid end to end just to check to make sure that everything uh, aligned correctly. I mean this this would have looked terrible if, uh, if it if there had been steps at the joints, the whole whole idea was to have a sort of sweeping um, geometry, and and uh, you know the accuracy was very important. So the four bridge sections, totaling 166 meters length and about 450 tons of steel were all loaded onto a barge and uh, sailed across the sea from Rotterdam to Copenhagen. So one of the big advantages of our site was that it was very easily ac accessed by water. So it naturally lent itself to that method of transportation and, and delivery. And there's the, the Sheerlig crane, 500 ton capacity crane uh, following the bridge sections. This is the site uh, ready for receipt 
of the bridge. Um, the two piers protected by the vessel collision protection system in the center there. This is a view into one of the piers for the moving sections. And you can see it's rather like the inside of a watch. Um, four motors, uh, which are attached via cogs to the slewing ring. Uh, those motors provide redundancy uh, in, in operation. Um, so I think we can we can afford for any one of those to be knocked out and the bridge still operates uh, as normal. Quite an interesting view. So all of the machinery is actually concealed from view uh, in its finished condition. And there's the crane erecting the steelwork on site. It's lifting the sections one by one off of the off of the barge. The whole installation process took around 10 days, uh, which is quite remarkable uh, and, and actually a, a good indication that all of the care that was taken in uh, constructing the bridge, fabricating it accurately, measuring the the bolts on site and ensuring that everything was going to fit when it arrived. Um, that was, you know, it, it all paid dividends when it came to the site work. Uh, that really was minimized and uh, minimal issues when the bridge was installed and commissioned. And of course, all of the control system and uh, bridge hydraulics, the moment connection, all of that had been tested um, very thoroughly with factory accept acceptance tests um, before uh, being brought to site. And there we are. This is the, the opening day of the bridge um, in uh, August 2019. Um, And I've now just got a few pictures of the finished bridge just to show you. Interesting plan view. Clearly show the different uh, lanes on the bridge for pedestrians and for cyclists. And there's a, a nice view of the of the edge member and how it changes position as you go along the bridge. And here again, we see the, the joints between the bridge sections. They have flaps uh, which are um, arranged so that they lift as the bridge sections move. There are uh, wheels and uh, tracks which are what is used to align the bridge sections. So both at the movement joints and at the central moment connection, there are these tracks um so a, a, a wheel engages and it pulls the bridge into alignment and the dimensioning of that arrangement was all done uh, based upon the exercise which i described to determine um, thermal effects on the bridge but also with a, a reasonably healthy allowance for construction tolerances and other effects So there is lighting in the bridge. Um, the, there are handrail lights, which alternately shine in and out. Uh, so some of them light the, uh, the, the, the bridge deck and perform a task lighting function. Some of them illuminate the outside of the bridge and that's all controllable to produce some quite spectacular effects. Uh, at night. Just a, you can see now see the bit more of the detail of the, the parapet, its mesh infill and the lights. And there's the bridge in operation with a tall ship going through. 
and it's being controlled from one position um, enables its its opening to be synchronized with the adjacent Langebro. So that works quite well. These bridge piers had to be designed not only for ship impact, despite the presence of the collision protection system, but also for very significant ice loads. Um, so either icebergs floating in the harbour or um, the harbour freezing over and uh, applying large pressure loads to those piers. So that was the governing uh, condition for the design of those piers. So just to conclude the presentation, I just a few highlight a few sort of key features of the project. I think, um, I mean, to me, I think it's it's been a fantastic project to be involved in. I think it's pretty unique. Um, the central moment connection was particularly interesting to 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 introduce that and just to see some of the beneficial effects of having that incorporated in the design. I think it has a number of, of uh, uh, positive positive advantages, uh, apart from uh, enabling the bridge to be more slender. It has a, this byproduct of um, improving the dy dynamic performance of the bridge. And then also it, it's much more robust and resilient to catering for uh, uh, discrepancies in, in, in alignment um, than a, the traditional locking pin type arrangement. And then I think um, congratulations really to the, the construction team for the standard of fabrication quality and uh, installation of, of the bridge. Um, even with all of our design taking into account construction tolerances and providing wherever we could for for those, uh, there was nevertheless still a requirement to really execute this bridge to the the highest possible standards, and I think that was uh, definitely achieved. So, just one final view of the bridge at dusk, and uh, the closing credits. And then it's over to... Um, Simon. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Simon. It's a really first-class um, presentation and a, and a fascinating project. Um, really a, an excellent, excellent design. I, I, as you probably know, know the site rather well um and uh, have been across your wonderful bridge so that's beautiful we've got we've got some a number of good questions and so i'm hoping we'll get some some good discussion going um and so i'm going to kick off with, with asking a few that have come in um the first one actually it, well there, there, there are two that sort of maybe slightly related um the first one which i was going to say was very straightforward which is how long was the construction you mentioned the 10 day installation of the actual spans, but obviously the, the overall length of the construction will be longer than that. But I'm going to uh, tag on to it another question. So that came from Benjamin Adrian. Uh, I'm going to tag on to another question, which was that there was a well-publicized accident during the uh, fabrication of the bridge. And the question is whether there's anything that we and the wider industry ought to learn from that incident. I suspect the answer to those two questions can be related. Yes, uh, well, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it, it's not something that I've, I've included in the presentation because it's not something that I, I've got a lot of direct knowledge of, but there was an accident at the fabrication workshop when the bridge sections were being loaded onto the barge. So um, the bridge construction originally was due to be completed in 2018, in August 2018. Uh, and in April 2018, the bridge sections had all been made ready and uh, were being loaded out ready to transport across to Denmark from Holland. The first two sections were put on uh, the barge uh, uh, by, by the sheer leg crane and uh, the next day they came back to place the next two sections. The third section was being lowered onto the barge and it got to within, I think about a hundred millimeters of its final position. And then the crane gave way. Uh, and there was a there was a, a backstay on the crane, which was a, a, 
attached to a super lift, I think. And uh, the, uh, it turned out that a world had failed on the crane and the bridge section was dropped. Uh, so the bridge section was dropped onto another bridge section. Um, as I say, it was 100 millimetres above it. But unfortunately, what then happened was that the crane then collapsed on top of the whole lot. Um, it was very fortunate that there was nobody injured. Or there, I think there were some minor minor injuries, but nobody was seriously injured. But there was a lot of material damage to the steelwork. Mm. And the, the upshot was that actually the, the whole bridge program was put back by a year. So yeah. rather than being complete in August 2018, it was complete in August 2019. But again, I mean, it was, you know, it was, uh, as I say, I, I'm not, I don't have direct knowledge of, of no. the incident. So I don't, <clears throat> there's a limit to what I should say. And what no, I, of course. I can no, say, no, but, but, I, but, but I, only... um, I think it's a testament to the people who, who built the bridge that they, they recovered from that yeah. and they managed to repair the bridge sections and, in actual fact, two of the bridge sections had to be entirely remade because of the incident. Mm. No, I mean, thank you for that. I mean, it, it, it was a well-publicised thing, as David Knight said in his question, um, but um, it's something that, uh, you know, we all hope never happens on our projects, but yeah. um, they, as you say, they recovered well. Let me ask a, um, a, a slightly more um, uh, technical question here. In fact, I think, again, there are two I can probably put together here because there's one... Uh, Eduardo Poe asks about the triangular boxes and whether they're watertight, and if so, whether internal pressure variation should, um, due to temperature variation uh, is, is, is a concern and design requirement. And there's another question actually about the durability and the um, corrosion protection system. So perhaps you could deal with both of those two in the same way. That second question comes from Ranjit Rathasinghe. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, they are the, the 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 hollow sections are all watertight. So every single section was air tested uh, to ensure that it's it's hermetically sealed, um, and we designed for pressure change inside internal pressure change. So that's just the best way to ensure yeah. that that remains. Uh, uh, you, you know, it, it, the, the durability is ensured. There are ducts which run inside those uh, triangular sections carry cables and so on but all of those ducts are stainless steel and they are sealed you know by welding in inside the, the section in terms of the protective treatment that's a it's the, the marine specification c5m um you know high specification paint system to try to minimize the amount of maintenance that required um, in that situation so, so the interior spaces are they painted? So the interior spaces are not treated. The only interior space because they're fully sealed, they're hermetically sealed. As I say, they were air tested to check to ensure that uh, you know, and any moisture was extracted. Uh, in terms of the, in terms of the, there are some compartments which have, which are accessible. So there are there's a compartment for the hydraulic power unit, which could be opened up to access. Uh, from outside that's got sealed diaphragms and that internal space is all got an internal paint system mm. applied to it but no the actual <laughs> main structural members they're not they're, they're just sealed they're not got protection. it's interesting i'm sure you'll uh, there'll be a number of people listening who have um, grappled with this issue on sealed yeah. boxes and and the different ways in which we argue uh, with our clients to, about whether it's uh, we, we, one system is better than another um, but uh, I don't know whether you had any particular difficulty persuading your client that this was the optimum uh, option. Um, no, I mean I know that there there are different opinions on it. Um, it does. It depends on all sorts of things. I mean, it depends on how if if you opt to internally protect, then you have to ideally also be able to access it to inspect what's going on inside um, and. You know, something as complex as, as our structure would be almost impossible to know what, to, you know, yeah. to, to, to provide sufficient access, even if you had an endoscope to get inside to, to have a look. So I think, yeah. you know, we, it's just better to, to, to seal the whole thing up. Yeah, no, very good. 
Um, there's a couple of questions about the moment connection, as I suspect you would have exp you would have <laughs> expected. Um, so let's just see if I can pull, pull some of these together. So um, <clears throat> uh, let's think where we take this. So um, <clears throat> the M&E design, uh, you mentioned obviously Eden Consulting, but I imagine there may have been some um, <clears throat> detailed design by one of the contractors. Yes. So yeah. you, could, you could elaborate on, on that. And I'll yeah. just sort of pick up on a few other things. This is Christopher Doyle from Arcadia's asking that question. Um, and there was a question, I'm just desperately trying to find it. <laughs> um, again, the design life, uh, design life of the bridge and how the hydraulic rams and slewing ring access for maintenance renewal. So if you, presumably all of that stuff is designed yeah. to be re 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 renewable. That's from Ivan Robinson from, uh, uh, I don't tell me who he's from. Yeah, so I should really have, have credited the <clears throat> SH group who were yeah. carried out the detailed design of the control system and the hydraulics and so forth based on an exemplar design which Eden Consulting prepared. So the two parties work very closely together in developing all of that. Um, in terms of inspection and maintenance and, and design life, all of that was you know very, very high on the list of priorities. So we had to get the bridge accepted by Copenhagen municipality who effectively <laughs> adopted it. Um, and, you know, they were very keen that we would design something that was robust and uh, easily maintained. So all of the Oh, those cylinders uh, and all the other components, they are designed to be replaceable. We, we've thought about the way in which you would lift them out. There are hatches which can be opened and then you can you can retrieve them out. I think some of the components have got a, a shorter design life, things like hydraulic hoses and so on. They don't last, unfortunately, as long as other components. So some of... The bridge itself is designed for 120 years, but uh, some of the mechanical parts will need to be replaced within that time scale, and obviously some of the protective treatments as well. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and I think, you know, the question about uh, the, um, hold on, I'm just trying to find it again. <laughs> These questions keep moving around. Um, <clears throat> there was a question about the moment connection being scalable. So, you know, that that's a really interesting idea. Um, Presumably, on a larger bridge, you know, you just have bigger, bigger sections. Um, uh, so somebody's asking here. Um, John uh, Olabli is asking about uh, using it on a on a motorway bridge. Um, presumably, there's no reason why not. No, absolutely not. And actually, ironically, we we were using the moment of connection to keep the bridge more slender. But of course, that meant that the lever arm between the upper and lower parts had to be relatively small. Yeah. Uh, and that meant that we had to have, you know, correspondingly larger cylinders to carry the forces. Whereas on another form of structure, you could, of course, increase that depth potentially and make uh, and for this with the same cylinder size, you know, yeah. be able to resist a much greater moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, your colleague, Peter Nugent, asks a question about the shape of the two pins, um, the different pins in the, at the moment connection. I, mean, I imagine, you know, one's in tension, one's in compression. That's a relatively straightforward thing to, to answer, but you could deal with that one. Well, they, uh, as I say, there are we there's a, a wheel which interacts with a track, um, which actually guides the bridge into position um, as it closes. But then the the, the compression pin also has a taper on it. So as it meets the socket, it's guide that, that the final bit of alignment is done via that um, first operation of driving the compression pin in. Yeah. And, and the, the, the hammerhead, as I call it, that is shaped to be captured by the tension socket at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And, that, you know, that we finite element analysis was done to prove that that could resist the, the maximum tension. So that's a bespoke piece of fabrication, that element. Very, very good. Uh, there'll be more more questions coming. I'm just going to ask one which is not on the list because I haven't written it. It's here on my pad in front of me. Um, <laughs> because uh, you will know that I was involved with a bridge just a little bit down the harbour. Um, and with a rather different sort of approach to the contracting arrangement, um, I was very interested to see your sort of international approach. Um, uh, you know, um, the, the ability, for example, to do those two competing mock-ups, which is fascinating. I've not seen that done before uh, as part of the tender, which means, of course, that the main contractors who are bidding 
have already decided on their steel fabricators and locked them in because presumably after that point you they were not allowed to change their steel fabricators. This is this is relatively unusual and certainly wasn't allowed on our project. Um, so so you managed to swing something there which I failed to do. Um, mm -hmm. Can you would you like to elaborate on anything well, to do with I mean, the process? I, I I mean I I totally agree with the sentiment behind your question, Ian. I think it's a key thing on on any but well bridge projects of this nature which have got such a huge reliance on the steel work um is to have the the steel fabricator locked in to the tender process because you know, otherwise you know you you don't know what what, what yeah. you're, you're signing up for I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree. <laughs> and and you know it was absolutely essential that we had you know a very very competent steel fabricator involved in this project and you know we both the tendering the final tendering companies fit, mm -hmm. fitted that category so we were very pleased with the quality of those mock-ups yeah. apart from you know it, it it proves to everybody that what what we're asking is achievable and what quality is is achievable so it mm -hmm. acts also acts as a bit of quality control um, for the remainder of the bridge because we can point to that as being very difficult to define some of the elements of quality in any other way you know um, yeah. so we could refer back to the mock-up I think that was good and and obviously people yeah. could see what the bridge was going to look like yeah. as well and, and ensure yeah. that the, the client could be happy that this was what they were all yeah were all. Uh, you obviously had a good you, you managed yeah. to get a good system there a good process there um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, we had an excellent client, and I mean, apart from anything else, the brief was very, very well written, and that always makes things so much easier because you know the requirements were very well defined. Like <laughs> following on, perhaps from, perhaps even from your project, you yeah, know, the, yeah, the, the yeah. lessons learned there. Oh, well, indeed, absolutely right, you know. absolutely right. Um, no mm. questions about that at all. Yeah. Um, question from David Hopper. How is access to the two central piers organized for routine maintenance and repair of the motors? It's a really good question, actually. Can you talk about some of the access and, and, and sort of routine maintenance things? And indeed, actually, yeah. perhaps not, not just the central pier, but those locking mechanisms at the center as well. It would be interesting to know what your plans are there. So the locking mechanisms are all accessible from the deck via hatches, which open up from the side. So uh, there are compartments within the, the, the side beams, which you, you will notice if you're looking for them, but because the parapet sort of is inclined, it kind of disguises them a little bit, um, you know, to the casual observer. In terms of all the machinery in the, effectively, what is a machine room inside the piers, there is an access, there's a, there's a hatch and then there's a, a, a deplor deployable ladder which will take you down and we've got, um, you know, a person arrest system and, and all of that sort of thing going on there. So you can get down into the pier. Um, I think the majority of the routine maintenance is, is just operating the bridge regularly and checking all of the pressure and the oil levels and everything like that. Majority of that is, can be, can be done, uh, you know, with, with minimal sort of, uh, access um you know that the, there are lots of sensors on the bridge to yeah. get that everything is as, as it should be um I, I love the fact that we've got a question from somebody you'll know very well Davoud is asking a question um which actually was going to be related to the one I wanted to ask about the budget because you mentioned at the beginning a budget <laughs> of nine million nine million pounds yeah, which yeah. struck me as being wow that's cheap um, I suppose my question was going to be, did they do it for that? But Davoud's mm. asked the question of how, um, uh, it's a comment really, not a question, how do we explain the low cost of this bridge compared to those built in the UK? Uh, the client of people of Copenhagen have certainly got excellent value for money. Can you elaborate? Do you I think they have got excellent <laughs> value for money, but I, I, we were a little bit fortunate in terms of the steel price because having looked at steel prices lately because of the the trend, the, the very significant upward trend, I noticed that they reached a, a sort of a low point just about the time when this bridge was tendered. Um, so we were fortunate from that point of view. Actually, the rate for steel was was very favourable. Um, I don't think the outturn cost was enormously um, outside of the budget. I think there, there were a few additional items incorporated into the contract so that pushed the price up but it was you know it was certainly in that ballpark which is extraordinary value for money particularly for a moving bridge 
I mean, it compares favorably, very favorably with bridges which um, are, are not moving bridges, you know, and, and, you know, it has, I suppose, although I would argue that it's a reasonably iconic design, all of that is achieved with the structure. So, you know, you're not paying uh, such a huge premium yeah, yeah. Uh, for, for that sort of, um, sort of aspect. Yeah, it's yeah, it's concentrated in some complicated mm. fabrication, but beyond that, it's relatively straightforward. Um, the, the, there are more questions here. Um, uh, actually, there are a couple of questions just about whether this was recorded, and I think the answer is yes, it is. So, those of you who are asking that question, uh, please note that it will be recorded, and I'm sure there'll be something uh, winging its way to you to explain to you how you can listen to that. Um, there's um, a question really relating, uh, sort of referring to the dynamic problem, dynamic um, issues that occurred on the London Millennium Bridge from Nigel Cooney. He's asking, given the use of the bridge for pedestrian and cyclists, were any lessons learned from the Millennium Bridge in terms of damping requirements? Well, I'm sure there were, uh, because <laughs> we have to do it on every single footbridge. But I don't know whether you want to comment on the dynamic performance. Well, it, it's a relatively wide structure. So actually, I mean, mm. it, 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 you know, it, it doesn't have a lateral response issue as as the Millennium Bridge did, but it could have a, a vertical response issue um, if it weren't for uh, uh, providing enough stiffness in the structure. And also, as I say, the the clamping at the central moment connection at, uh, on the longest span that really does significantly improve matters. Yes, it would do. Actually, I'd wanted yes, I wanted to elaborate, or I wanted you to elaborate a bit more on that because obviously you you talk about the mechanical joint at the middle and how it made it possible to make it that much more slender, and as you say, also dynamic performance. But but I, I presume you did initially look at a, a slightly more conventional solution, which would have been with a, a gap in the middle and a, yeah. a, a sort of joint at the back. Um, how much difference did it actually make? I mean, was it that significant? Yeah, I think it's at least a, a factor of two. I, oh, really? I mean, okay. perhaps have included a slide which showed the uh, the other versions. Yeah. As you say, yeah. but you, I think there is an example in Copenhagen of a bridge which basically cantilevers from its support, and you can the the, the depth is you know significant as you can imagine for yeah. thirty five meter opening um, span. You obviously that the, the actual supports have got to be further apart than that so Sorry, of course you're talking about that pretty significant <laughs> yeah, a three to four meters sure, sure, sure. Depth, deep structure at least yes yeah, so you're talking about the, the depth at the support as opposed mm. to obviously that's the, right yeah exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's what you're referring yeah, to yeah the mid span no, that would be potentially be um, lower but the idea was that you could see over the side of the bridge all the yeah. way along rather than just uh, you know in yeah. portions yeah there was a question, actually, I think you did address it in your talk, but just somebody's asking you about the diaphragms being welded internally. Yeah. Um, I think you did point out they're only welded on two sides because somebody's asking, this is Christopher Doyle again, asking about the uh, internal access, but I don't think yeah. there's any. No, that's right. Well, the majority, we have regular diaphragms, which are just to hold the shape of the of the of the edge member and, and provide stiffness wherever a <clears throat> first member frames in. And then we have diaphragms above the supports, and those had to be welded all the way round, and and we had to do those in short sections so that you could access inside, and then splice on the adjacent pieces of steelwork. Yeah. But the, yeah, the the typical diaphragm is only welded on the two sides nearest the deck, with yeah. the outer side not uh, not welded, which also improves. You know, you get this hungry dog effect. Yeah. Uh, if you're not careful when you weld lots of stiffeners on the outside of the bridge so actually that, that has the benefit of avoiding that problem well. yeah. Yeah. Very good. um i wonder whether you could just I, I don't know how much longer we want to go on it's nearly it's nearly seven o'clock but um what i there's a couple of questions about the more architectural sort of aspects so you, you touched on the the curved alignment uh, which obviously aligns with the two streets which i think answers one of the questions but 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 also this question about these bird wings and the and the uh, sort of flapping boxes, um, it, it's very elaborate, isn't it? Um, and I suppose I'm interested to know sort of how that evolved. And certainly Margot Sulek is asked from the University of Sheffield, student at Sheffield, asking about how you know that that, that sort of idea gave rise to the structural shape and which came first? Is it kind of chicken? I think, well, I remember having workshops where we talked about the required 
structural depth along the bridge. And I suppose, um, you know, the the idea of the, the 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 gentle sort of sweeping nature of the edges was just effectively joining the dots mm-hmm. <laughs> in a way. Uh, you know, we we had we knew what we wanted to do in terms of the opening section, and then it just sort of it worked from there. Um, there are simpler ways of doing it, yeah, but. <laughs> It's, uh, it was a bridge competition, so we had to do something. Obviously, the client was not looking for the absolute uh, most basic structure. They wanted something with some, uh, you know, with some appeal. So sure, sure. Um, there's there's one slightly more technical question, which I will I will uh, read out. This is another one from Eduardo Poe, um, and and I think I know where you're going to go with this, but well, I'll read it as it's exactly as it's written. May I ask which verification method was adopted for the steel plates of such irregular geometry? Effective width to reduce stress method uh, or more advanced methods. May you mention how the combination of longitudinal transfer stresses uh, uh, were considered in verifications? Of course, that's a rather more detailed thing about how you go about all this stuff, but perhaps you could just elaborate a little bit on that. Well, we we, we essentially relied on a lot on working from first principles within the confines of Sorry. the Euler code. Mm-hmm. So we, we tended to do, once we'd done our initial analysis and, and got an initial sizing and so forth, we do much more detailed nonlinear analysis to check the stability of, of, of plates, particularly the ones that were doubly curved and so on. So it's really much easier than trying to apply uh, formulae and you know which aren't really suited to the purpose, just to work from first principles, that incorporate initial imperfections and so on, and uh, and, and analyze it that way. So yeah. that's how we did that. Very good. Um, we are run, run, probably running a little bit short of time, but I can't resist this one um, because there's a gentleman called Simon Roberts, who you also know, um, <laughs> uh, and and he's 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 being a bit coy because he's asking the question. Excellent presentation of a beautiful bridge. Thank you. Uh, well, you all know uh, Simon. Could you please speak? And you better explain who Simon is. I'll let you do that. Um, could you please speak a bit about the collaboration between architect, engineer, and ultimately contractor? Who was responsible for the accuracy of the three D models used? And if they were shared, where does the liability fall? <laughs> There's a minefield. I suspect he, Simon you, was the you, answer. Simon. Simon, excellent. Good question. Yeah. Well, I si- should explain that Simon Roberts was in no small part uh, responsible for the bridge himself, being the architect for Wilkinson Air. So, you know, my hat off to him for, for an excellent architectural design. Um, in terms of the 3D model, um, it was something that was carried through from from start to finish. Uh, it wasn't quite. We weren't quite at the stage of uh, uh, you know 5D BIM models for this project. It was done in a slightly more um, you know slightly cruder fashion. Um, but ultimately, um, there was a 3D model. But the fabricators don't work to the theoretical final geometry of the bridge they work to the fabrication geometry so there is always a stage where either the theoretical model is adjusted in some way or it has to be rebuilt incorporating all the presets and pre and so on mm-hmm. and allowances for shortening of plates and so on so actually in this case Hollandia who were the the, the steel fabricator were uh, they they built their own model on, based upon our design model, which which takes account of all of these sort of features, and did they then carry the liability for the GZ yeah. geometry? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So they would, they, in terms of the fabrication accuracy, we, I mean, we we tried to define what the the performance of the the, the bridge had to be, and then they had to 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 fabricate it to to meet that accuracy. Very good. Um, I think probably uh, just for time for 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 one more, um, which is actually again another slightly more technical one, but it's again going back to your moment connection again. Uh, this is from Guillermo Munoz Cobo from Arab. I can't sorry about your pronunciation, um, my pronunciation. Um, great presentation, thank you. I wanted to ask about the hydraulic circuit allowing for the flow between the sides of the moment connection, where there's any redundancy and how you deal with any potential failure, which actually is a question I wanted to ask as well, the question of leak control. You don't want the hydraulic fluid in the, in the harbour. 
Uh, in addition, whether the moment connection considered 100% of actual moment connection or any degree of reduction was considered. So, um, uh, uh, so the the, uh, the the moment connection does consider the full 100% moment. I mean, there are safety factors involved in in the mechanical equipment and so on. So there, you know, there's there's a degree of redundancy there. If the mechanical equipment were to fail entirely, then most likely there would be a serviceability failure of the bridge. It would become it would start to deflect too much. But it's very unlikely there would be an ultimate limit state failure of the bridge because it still has, you know, quite a bit of strength uh, elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, hydraulic leaks are contained because the um, hydraulic equipment is all inside a, a, a compartment which has got a uh, you, you, you know if the oil was to leak it would just be within a sump rather than mm -hmm. able to escape yeah. um, so that that's all contained so yeah I mean there's always the possibility that might occur uh, and there's monitoring of the pressure within the system so that, that you know that could be detected yeah. I'm going to take terms for privilege and ask the final question. Um, when, I, when I walked across the bridge, I was ta very taken by the way that the parapet, the, uh, the handrail of the parapet, sort of uh, inclines as you walk across, so that when you're in at mid-span, the thing is virtually horizontal. And so you have a handrail, obviously, at the same height as it is everywhere else, but there's this net outside it. Uh, so the rather strange and unusual situation that I could quite happily climb over that handrail and lie in the net and enjoy sunbathing or if i felt like it jump over the side into the water has anybody done that <laughs> yeah well people various people have um it seems to be quite a popular place to to slide off the edge and into the into the harbor <laughs> uh, obviously we we don't encourage that um and the, the parapet is actually uh, it's sized for cyclists so it's it's 1.4 meters high. So oh, but you can climb over that. You, you can you can climb over it, but I would argue you'd have. To, I mean, you have to 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 be deliberately climbing over it. it you, yeah. you can't really pretend that you accidentally climbed over the <laughs> parapet and fell in the harbor. I mean, there's a limit to. We we managed to to we we, we undertook a risk assessment, and and this was something which did crop up. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure that children, for example, wouldn't uh, be attracted to, to climbing on this thing and, and, mm. and, and, and be because, you know, they won't necessarily sure. apply the same sure. sort of standards of sure. care. But, I mean, we, when we managed to satisfy everybody that it was it was reasonable. But, yeah, undoubtedly, people could could do that if they really wanted to, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah. It's, Maybe it's the rebel in me that was considering such a thing. Yeah. <laughs> normally, when you climb, try to climb over a parapet, it's an immediate drop the other side, so you tend yeah. not to want to do it. But in that case, you can climb over the handrail and, and you're in, you're safe because you're yeah. held by the net. Anyway, Simon, thank you so much. I think uh, we've been treated to a really interesting uh, presentation. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing it with us. Uh, and well done with a really great design. And I'm delighted that Simon Roberts is also on, on the call. I wish we could have heard from him uh, as well but um really really good to to see that bridge i'm delighted to have been able to see it myself um one of those bridges that i would put down on the many the long long list of designs i wish i'd done myself uh, so very well done and and congratulations and thank you for your lecture uh, so um on uh, on on that note i think probably there's enough that's enough said i don't think i've got any specific announcements i need to make maybe a disembodied voice will suddenly come aloud and we'll hear it if, if i need to be saying something but otherwise um thank you very much simon and thank you all of you for attending and for all your questions um a very enjoyable evening thank you so much thank you